turn this evening to the Word of God as we find it in Deuteronomy chapter 23. So if you have a copy of the Word of God, please turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 23. If you're visiting with us tonight for the very first time, we want to extend to you a very warm welcome in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We trust you'll enjoy your time with us. If you haven't brought a copy of the Bible with you, please feel free to use one of the Bibles that are nearby on the seats and that's why they're there for your benefit as we read together God's holy word. We're in Deuteronomy, the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy, the 23rd chapter, and we're going to commence to read together at verse 15. Verse 15. So let us hear together the word of God. You shall not give up to his master a slave who has escaped from his master to you. He shall dwell with you in your midst in the place that he shall choose within one of your towns. Wherever it suits him, you shall not wrong him. None of the daughters of Israel shall be a cult prostitute, and none of the sons of Israel shall be a cult prostitute. You shall not bring the fee of a prostitute or the wages of a dog into the house of the Lord your God in payment for any vow, for both of these are an abomination to the Lord your God. You shall not charge interest on loans to your brother, interest on money, interest on food, interest on anything that is lent for interest. You may charge a foreigner interest, but you may not charge your brother interest that the Lord your God may bless you in all that you undertake in the land that you are entering to take possession of it. If you make a vow to the Lord your God, you shall not delay fulfilling it, for the Lord your God will surely require it of you, and you will be guilty of sin. But if you refrain from vowing, you will not be guilty of sin. You shall be careful to do what has passed your lips." For you have voluntarily vowed to the Lord your God what you have promised with your mouth. If you go into your neighbor's vineyard, you may eat your fill of grapes, as many as you wish, but you shall not put any in your bag. If you go into your neighbor's standing grain, you may pluck the ears with your hand, but you shall not put a sickle to your neighbor's standing grain. Amen. And so reads God's holy word. Join with me as we seek the Lord's blessing, the Lord's help as we come this evening to His word. Let's pray together. Our blessed God, our Father who is in heaven, we're gathered together tonight to seek You as the God of all creation and the God of all providence. You alone are God, and besides you there are no other gods in all of the universe. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the true and the living one, in whom we live and move and have our being. And O our God, as we gather before you this evening, it is with thankful hearts that we once again are able to sing your praises, to seek you in prayer, to read your word, and to hear it preached. We pray now that you would come by the ministry of your Holy Spirit to each and every one of us to grant us understanding, to search us out, O God, in the innermost parts of our hearts and to lead us to the Lord Jesus Christ. We bless you and we thank you that he is our righteousness, that he is the fulfillment of the law, and that through faith in him, all the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us. So our God, teach us your way. Grant us understanding. Transform us by your grace into the likeness of your Son. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you take time to watch a young child long enough, you will soon discover that with regards to their nature, it won't take long for them to manifest their tendencies towards sin, towards breaking 
God's law. If you exhort a child not to do something, you may well quickly turn around and then turn back to see the child is doing that which you said they ought not to do. Forbid them to bounce on the sofa. You turn around and they're bouncing on the sofa. Explain to them that they're not to throw their toys. And across the room flies a toy. When I was five years old, I lived quite near to a newsagent shop. The name of that newsagent shop was very Scottish, McCutcheon's Newsagents. Now in Scotland, in the 1970s, newsagent shops had sections where they sold toys. When I was a boy, I loved hats and helmets. I had an Indian headdress. I had a cowboy hat. I had a space helmet. One day I was in McCutcheon's newsagents with my mother. As a five-year-old, I spotted in the toy section a red motorbike helmet with a beautiful yellow stripe and goggles to go with it. And I thought to myself as a five-year-old, I need that hat. And so I quickly asked my mother if she would buy it for me. And in her meanness as a parent, she said no. And I went home very sad without the helmet. In the kindness of God, the phone rang at home. And my mother was drawn away to talk to her friend. Knowing where my mother's purse was, I decided that I would rectify my dep deprivation and take some money from her purse and run round to the newsagent shop and purchase that lovely red helmet. One of the problems of being five at the time was I had no idea how much the helmet cost. I wasn't very good with coins, and so I couldn't count out how much I needed. But after two trips, while my mother was still on the phone, I made my acquisition of my lovely new plastic helmet. Came home, took my bicycle out, put my helmet on, cycled around in the front yard, much to my delight with my new toy. There was only one problem. I hadn't worked out that my mother would not be on the telephone forever. And she came out to ask me, where did I get my helmet? And of course, she proceeded to take the helmet off me, march me back to the newsagent shop, require her money back, and give back the helmet. That's why I don't have it tonight to show you. <laughs> Notwithstanding the humorous elements of that story that I've told many times to children, I've never forgotten the sense of guilt and shame that I felt that day when my mother was so embarrassed by her thieving little boy. No one taught me how to steal. No one encouraged me to steal. Stealing came naturally to my soul as a five-year-old boy. Even at five, I knew how to be a thief. God hates stealing. God has made it very clear that stealing is a sin. And as Moses prepared Israel for the promised land, Moses directed the people to the law of God that he had received on Mount Sinai. And he directed them to the eighth commandment, you shall not steal. And as we come tonight to Deuteronomy 23, verses 15 through 25, it might seem at first glance that what we have here in this section is a number of disconnected directives from God. Simply a hodgepodge, if you will, of different 
instruction, different commandments. But I would want to suggest to you, indeed I would want to assert tonight, that what we have here in Deuteronomy 23, 15 through 25, is the, the great lawgiver Moses moving from the seventh commandment, where he's addressed the issues of sexual purity, uh, to the eighth commandment, where he's addressing the issues of the sanctity of private property and the commandment that you shall not steal. And as he does this, what I want you to see from this passage this evening is the fact that in this commandment, God's concern is not only about the sanctity of private property, but it is about the generosity of the heart of His people, Israel. And so as we come to this passage tonight, I'm calling this sermon God's Call to Generosity because in the five situations that Moses uh, rehearses here for us as he applies the eighth commandment to the life of Israel, uh, we're going to see that what God's concern is for Israel is this, that when they go into the promised land, into the land of Canaan, that God has promised to give them they will be a generous people. And they will be a generous people by understanding the outworkings of the Eighth Commandment in their lives. And so come with me into the text as we unpack this interesting section of uh, Moses' instruction here. We're still in the second address, lengthy sermon that he's giving uh, to Israel to prepare them for the, the promised land. Come into this passage with me, and let's consider together God's call to generosity as we look at the five scenarios, the five examples, if you will, uh, of the application of the eighth uh, commandment of the law of God. Notice, first of all, the example of the runaway slave. We have that in verses 15 through 16. Moses here, in raising the eighth commandment into the consciousness of Israel, does so by speaking to them about a scenario that would have undoubtedly happened at times in their life. That is, a runaway slave or a servant amongst them uh, that comes perhaps from a pagan land and outside of Israel, perhaps even from uh, within the nation, uh, we need to remember, of course, that the nature of slavery in the ancient Near East is not to be equated exactly with the chattel slavery of the Americas in the 18th and the 19th century. But notwithstanding the distinctions that should be made, I want you to see the exhortation here that Moses is making and how it relates to what I believe is a, rel a relation to the Eighth Commandment. Escaped slaves who have run away from their master, most likely because of abusive treatment, one would imagine, quite possibly from the surrounding pagan nations, God says to Israel, are to be taken care of. And contrary to the laws of the nations around Israel, they were not to be returned to those nations, but they were to be freed. They were to be released. And notice how they are to be treated. They are uh, to dwell with the Israelites in their midst, in the place that they shall choose within one of your towns, wherever it suits them. This is extravagant generosity from God. And God wants His people to reflect it. And so we see here that they are not to wrong the slave who has run away, who has come into their midst, they're not to wrong him by sending him back. No, they are to release him and give him a place to live amongst them. Now, you know as well as I do, don't you, that if you steal a person, right, it's called kidnapping, the law of God makes it very clear that it is sinful. And so, here as Moses raises the issue of the Eighth Commandment, he addresses the issue then of man-stealing indirectly to teach Israel the importance of obeying his law and being generous to those who have become slaves who now should be freed. And so we see, don't we, here, the generosity of God towards the oppressed. 
We see here the generosity of God towards these slaves, and we see here God instructing his people through Moses to reflect the generosity of God to the escaped slave who is to be freed and not to be sent back. Notice then the second example in our passage. It's the example of what I'm calling the inappropriate offering, and we have that in verses 17 through 18. Here, Moses moves on from the matter of runaway slaves to what we might call inappropriate offerings in the temple or in, uh, before the Lord. Now, again, in the ancient Near East, it was common amongst pagan nations for temple prostitution to take place. That is, idolatrous worship, false worship would take place in and, and shrines and where temples were set up. Uh, whether male or female, there would often be acts of sexual immorality uh, that would be offered up. Money would pass. Uh, transactions would take place. All in an attempt to appease false gods who these unbelieving idolaters believed would either make them fertile or would bless their herds or their crops or whatever. Now remember, Israel is going into a land that is marked by this kind of religious conduct. The Canaanites were well known for their temple prostitution. And Moses is warning Israel here to avoid this whole practice that they are not to take it on. And he's warning them that any kind of uh, prostitution that takes place with regards to false worship, where there's money tra transacting hands, they are not to bring this into the temple and offer it in their worship to the Lord. Notice how Moses describes it. These are an abomination to the Lord your God. And so here we see that in failing to worship God, as God commands. There is a transgression of the eighth commandment. Because what is going on when you fail to worship God as God commands? You are robbing God of His due honor, of His due glory, of that which He rightfully deserves. We see here very clearly that there is a, a lack of regard for the glory and the honor of God. There is a stealing from God taking place. Tying it again, you see, to this, the eighth commandment that Moses is addressing here. This uh, reality indicates a lack of generosity of heart in giving to God offerings that are acceptable. Giving to God that which is rightfully the Lord's and not using that which is a prostitution of those things that people obtain. In this case, money. So we see there's a tie. There's a tie with this actual practice of cult prostitution and a warning. Now, you say the wages of a dog. Let me just indicate to you here, that really could be translated actually in the Hebrew as the wages of a male prostitute. It's translated in our ESV as dog, but it would be a male prostitute. So here Israel has been warned again about the violation of the Eighth Commandment. They've been warned again about a lack of generosity toward God in the sense of robbing God with regards to His worship. That brings us to the third example, verses 19 and 20. The example of the inappropriate interest. Here in this third example, we see very clearly that Moses ties in the Eighth Commandment to the matter of loans that are actually used in the covenant community. God doesn't prohibit loans amongst His people. He does prohibit charging interest if we give someone a loan. Making money, making profit from one another in the covenant community is sinful. And that's what we need to see. That's what we need to understand. Those outside of the covenant community, God says, fine, charge interest. He's talking there about the wider uh, economy. But in the covenant community of God's people, there should be what? Generosity towards each other. Consideration of how we might support one another uh, to do well. Now, this isn't new in Israel's experience. Turn back for a minute to Exodus chapter 22. Exodus chapter 22, and interestingly enough, in the context of 
a just society amongst God's people in the covenant community. We read this in verse 25. If you lend money to any of my people with you who is poor, you shall not be like a money lender to him, and you shall not exact interest from him. All Moses is doing here is reiterating what he's already taught the people of God, reminding them again of what God's standard of righteousness amongst them ought to be. Turn to Leviticus chapter 25. In Leviticus chapter 25, verse 38, we read this, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt to give you the land of Canaan and to be your God. A reminder, you see, of the redemption. Verse 39, and if your brother becomes poor beside you and sells himself to you, you shall not make him serve as a slave. He shall be with you as a hired worker and as a sojourner. He shall serve you with, with you until the year of the jubilee. Then he shall go out from you and he and his children with him and go back to his own clan and return to the possession of his fathers. There was to be no taking advantage of one another in the covenant community of God's people. And here we see it then in Deuteronomy 23, 19 through 20. You shall not charge interest on loans to your brother, interest on money, interest on food, interest on anything that is lent for interest. In other words, you'll be generous in how you lend to one another in the covenant community of God's people. To charge interest is to steal from your brother, is to steal from your sister. You see, God is teaching his people that it is good and it is right to help one another and to lend to one another for the benefit of helping one another. But what it is wrong to do is to profit from your brother. To profit from your brother. To charge interest for a loan given is to be guilty of stealing from your brother. Now, we know, don't we, in the wider community, the wider society of our nation, that there is a lot of exploitation goes on when it comes to money and it comes to interest. Exorbitant rates are charged. Any of us who know anything about it realize that it's all motivated by greed and a lack of generosity. Well, that's the world, not the covenant community of God's people. And so there is this example of the inappropriate interest. And then the fourth example we see in our passages in verses 21 through 23, the example of the unfulfilled vow. The example of the unfulfilled vow. Moses is moving here from the sin of charging a brother interest to the matter of vowing to God and fulfilling the vow that you make. Biblically, biblically speaking, a vow is a promise that we make to God with regards to something that we commit to do. Moses makes it clear that vowing to God is a serious business. To vow and not pay is to be guilty of being unfaithful to God. It's robbing God of your faithfulness. It's a violation of the Eighth Commandment. It is to be dishonest before the Lord. Moses states that it's better actually not to vow than to vow and not pay because to vow binds us to fulfill. And here we see, don't we, the matter that's so tragic in our culture, the matter of integrity, Connected in with the Eighth Commandment. It shouldn't surprise us, should it? Because really, what is stealing? It's a form of dishonesty. A form of dishonesty, right? We take which is not ours, that which we, that doesn't belong to us, and we keep it for ourselves. To make a vow and to fail to pay, that is to steal from the one that you owe the fulfillment to. You take out a loan, you don't pay it. You broke your vow. You promised you would pay back the money. It is to steal. You make a vow in marriage. You don't pay it. You violate it. You break your marriage vow. You've stolen from that person. And in a day in which integrity and trustworthiness are so rare, we see here, don't we, the sinfulness of our society played out. We recognize that God's covenant community is supposed to be different. 
The conduct of the people of God is supposed to be different. Not the same as the world, but different from the world. And then we come to the fifth example. And I'm calling this simply the, the example of the free grapes and the free grain. Yes, in Israel there was something called a free meal. We see it in verses 24 and 25. If you go into your neighbor's vineyard, you may eat your fill of grapes. Not sure how you'll be feeling after that, but there you go. As many as you wish, but notice, you shall not put any in your bag. This is a very curious application, I think, of the Eighth Commandment, very helpful application, because here, this final scenario that Moses raises in this section of our passage, it relates to the matter of the property of farmers, whether vineyards or grain crops. The directive is most likely given uh, because of the fact that in Israel, the agrarian culture, if you were traveling from one place to another, there was a possibility as you traveled that you might find yourself at lunchtime somewhere in the hillside, and you might find that, hey, there's a guy with a vineyard, and hey, I haven't got any lunch, and what am I going to do? Well, God is providing for his people's sustenance and their well-being, but he's not providing for their greed. Their need, no problem. Their greed, no chance. And so here we see very clearly, don't we, the generosity of God. Because here's the reality. Your neighbor's vineyard isn't yours. But you are allowed to go in there and eat some of the grapes if you're hungry. It's a very humanitarian provision that God is giving here. But in eating the grapes of your neighbor if you're hungry... You're not allowed to take any home in your bag for later. That in itself puts a hedge around how much you're going to take, doesn't it? And you see the same with regarding the standing grain. And you've got the backdrop here, haven't you, to so much of what you read in the life of Jesus with his disciples walking around in Israel and engaging in different aspects of life and how it is that they're walking in grain fields and they're, they're plucking the heads of grain. It's all here in the Old Testament, giving us the backdrop to that which this is to come. But here we see God's law addressing hunger, but preventing theft. God makes provision for the needs of his people, but he never condones their greed, because greed leads to theft and stealing is forbidden. And so we, we look at these five examples of the application of you shall not steal. And we ask ourselves, well, well, what are we to make of this as the people of God in, in Christ in the 21st century? Well, what I want to say to you this evening is quite straightforward. Here is a call to generosity in our life. In speaking to the various scenarios that we've considered from this passage, the heart of God is surely clear for us to see. We see the concern for generosity that God reveals here. We see the reality of God's generous heart. Generosity to the runaway slave. Generosity in the worship of God. Generosity to our brother in loaning him things. Generosity in our keeping our word when we vow. Generosity to those who are hungry and in need. If you're a Christian here tonight, it should not surprise you, should it, that God reveals himself in the Old Testament as generous. There should be no surprise for us to discover here that as God calls Israel out of the uh, slavery of Egypt and takes them through the wilderness and brings them in to the promised land, there should be no surprise to us that we see here God is generous. Indeed, as I was sharing with the men in the room behind here, when I was a boy, or in my late teens, Dr. Donald McLeod sometimes would come and preach from the free church. And he was an interesting preacher. He would look straight at the clock and just preached to the clock the whole time. He never looked at the congregation, just preached to the clock. I used to sort of want to go do this, right? But, so he preached at the clock, he just preached at the clock. But I remember a sermon he preached. I never forgot because it had such an impact on me. A, a sermon from Isaiah on what he called the great extravagance of the grace 
of God. And he talked, of course, about Christ, the one whom God sent into the world, as we heard this morning, to seek and to save that which was lost. And brothers and sisters, as we gather tonight before the Lord, and as we read his word, and as we consider his law as he gave it through Moses to Israel, and as we consider then the flow of historical uh, revelation that we have in Scripture and redemptive history, and we think upon uh, the, the reality of the gospel in Jesus Christ, we're not surprised, are we, that God is generous. Why? Because we've tasted the generosity of God in the most glorious way a sinner can taste the generosity of God. In Jesus Christ himself. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have ever lasting life. When you consider where all this is going in redemptive history as Israel come into the land of Canaan and, and God's presence is amongst them and, and he's giving them the promises of the, the one who is yet to come, we, we see, don't we, that what God has done in the gospel is the ultimate re revelation of the magnitude of the generosity of the God of all creation. There is no greater display no greater demonstration of the generosity of God than in the person and work of Jesus Christ. God himself come in the flesh in order to save sinners. In all of human history, the great extravagance of grace centers in upon the one that we heard of this morning, the Israel of God who is Jesus Christ. So when we consider the law of God, when we consider regarding the law of God regarding stealing, there's not one of us here this evening who doesn't have what that little five-year-old boy has carried for 50 years in his conscience, a measure of guilt and shame. Why? Because we know that he broke the law of God. He knows that he broke the law of God. Right? We're all guilty. But thankfully, in Christ, there is forgiveness for our law-breaking. There is forgiveness for the thief. There is forgiveness for the one who steals. And it is to be found in the one who kept the law perfectly. And the one who satisfied the law perfectly. And the one who bore our sins for our law-breaking on the cross, in his own body, on the tree, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the epitome of the generosity of God toward us in the Lord Jesus Christ. God has done the most glorious thing possible. He has secured for us forgiveness for our law-breaking that we might be right with him. But more than that, he secured for us the gift of the Holy Spirit, that we might be enabled by his grace to do what Israel would fail to do, obey his law. Now, of course, we will not obey his law perfectly, but we can be pursuing a lawful life sincerely. Now, how do I know this? We'll turn for a minute to Ephesians chapter 4. The Apostle Paul was very familiar with the Old Testament. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. But in Christ, he came to understand the fulfillment of the law in the Lord Jesus. And as he preached the gospel to the Gentiles, what do we discover? He preached to them that they in Christ could be right with God, they in Christ could be forgiven for sin, but more than that, they in Christ could have the power of the Holy Spirit. So what? So that they could live righteously before God. And notice what he says in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 28. A good word for a five-year-old thief. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, 
doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. What is it that God offers to us in Jesus Christ? Forgiveness for our law-breaking, absolutely, praise his name. But more than that, the gift of his Spirit, whereby he writes the law of God upon our hearts, that we might then fulfill the righteous requirements of the law through believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, which simply means this, that we as Christians would not be thieves, but we would work honestly with our hands, not simply to provide for ourselves, but that we might have something extra to give to those who are in need. In other words, reflect his generous character. Brothers and sisters, this is what it means to be a Christian. This is what it means to be in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what it means for grace to be working itself out in the lives of sinners. Of all the people in the world, we who are in Christ, we who are the recipients of the great extravagance of grace in Christ, we should be what? The most generous people. The most generous people. Let me ask you, how is your generosity? Well, it's good to be able to preach this sermon tonight in the light of the generosity that the church showed yesterday when we were able to help another church in their time of need. And we bless God for that. And as Pastor Steve said this morning in commending the congregation, those who were able to help and serve, the reality is that although not everybody was here to help and serve, the ones who were here to help and serve in this building that the rest of us have all provided to help uh, provide for, the whole church was involved. The whole church was involved, and I bless God. I think we can we say this as your pastors. How's your generosity? Praise God. Yesterday, it was wonderfully manifest as we helped our dear brothers and sisters at River City Grace. And would to God we would be indeed known for our generosity in this place. And I can honestly say as one who's enjoyed that for 20 years, that we have a generous spirit in our church. There's a generous spirit amongst us. As a church, we must corporately seek to be what God wants us to be, generous as much as we can. Individually, we must seek to be generous. Generous with our money. Generous with our possessions. Generous with our homes. Generous with the gifts that the Lord has given to us. For this is the will of God for our lives. That we would be reflecting the character of our God in the way that we live with each other, in the way that we help one another, in the way that we serve one another. And I bless God that that is going on. But brothers and sisters, remember, we are not yet glorified. There's always room to be more generous. There's always room to be growing in our generosity. Look for opportunities. Seek them out. There are many needs in our congregation. Many needs. Some are known, some are not so known. Come and talk to the elders. Come and talk to the deacons. I'm glad that there are people from time to time will come. And they'll say to me, Pastor, I have some money. I'd like to do something with it. How can I help someone? I bless God for that spirit. Spirit of generosity. Uh, Pastor, I have some possessions. I have some things I'd like to give away. Now, I I'm not talking just about IBC Social. Right? I'm glad that IBC Social is there at times. There are other times I'm like, who's, who's giving what away? That doesn't mean if you give something away that might suit me, I might just take it. But the reality is, right, there's a generous generosity amongst us, brothers and sisters, that I bless God for. You're to be commended for that. Praise the Lord. But brothers and sisters, we must always be looking for more opportunities. There are always needs in families. There are always needs with neighbors. 
There are even needs with our enemies. With our enemies. You see, how do we confound the enemies of the gospel? By not being like the enemies of the gospel. By being like Jesus towards our enemies. Maybe in the workplace, you've got one of those people that every day you need to pray for grace to just go there and be in their orbit. But what if you took Paul in Romans 12 at face value and you recognize what? That in order to win someone, you might overcome their evil with your good. That's generosity. That you might pour hot coals on their head. Those who are hateful, you are loving. That's generosity. That's grace. That's how God has treated us. And my dear brothers and sisters, it's so important for us to see this in family and neighbors and with our enemies. Our God is generous, extravagantly generous. We must seek Him to be like Him in our generosity. Maybe that you're not a Christian here tonight. You are actually, if the truth be told, privately a bit of a thief. Now, it might be something as simple as the fact that you fill in your timesheets dishonestly. You steal from your employer. It might be that as we're coming up to that time of the month or time of the year, as Eduardo prayed earlier, you're thinking, I ain't declaring that. I'll save myself some money with the old IRS because after, after all, that is the devil in America, right? But you see, here's the thing. All of it reveals something about us, doesn't it? All of it reveals something about us. And God wants us to be generous in the inner man. Now, don't misunderstand me. This is a Scotsman preaching this to you, right? Though, as I've reminded you before, it's Aberdonians in Scotland that are the type ungenerous people. It is not Glaswegians. That's someone from Glasgow for the uneducated. The reality is, it may be you're here tonight and you know in your heart that there are areas of your life where you steal. You're dishonest. Other people may not know, but let me tell you something. God knows. And those who are thieves by nature and pattern of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. But I want to encourage you this evening. There is forgiveness with the Lord. I know it because I was a thief pretty early on in life. Right? I bless God for the forgiveness that there is with the Lord. And I want to encourage you tonight to know that if you come to Christ, you will be forgiven. But more than that, you will be given grace. You'll be given the gift of the Spirit to begin to walk honestly, to begin to walk uprightly, to be someone yourself who begins to be generous and determine that you will not steal any longer. And this is what it means to be in Christ and to be pursuing a holy life. In his excellent little book on the Ten Commandments, Kevin DeYoung quotes our Kent Hughes' Recording, uh, regarding generosity. And Hugh says this, every time I give, talking about money, he says, I declare that money does not control me. Perpetual generosity is a perpetual de-deification of money. What he's saying there is this, that when we give perpetually in a generous way, we're showing that money is not our God. The young then continues, he says this, where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. But the reverse is also true. Where your treasure goes, your heart tends to follow. If you put all your treasure into your stuff, your toys, your man cave, your exercise room, your care, or your home, then your heart is going to go there. If you're having a hard time getting your heart in the right place, the young says this, then send your money ahead, then your heart will follow. 
And what he's saying there is this, seek first the kingdom of God. And invest in the kingdom of God. And as you do that, even with your money, guess what your heart will start to do? It will go after the kingdom of God as you give to the Lord. When you give generously to the church, De Jong says, and to other kingdom-minded causes and organizations, you will find that your heart becomes interested in what is happening there. My dear brothers and sisters, it has always been God's will for his covenant community to be generous. May God help us to realize this and to seek to be generous in all of our dealings, not for our own glory, but for the glory of the most generous God who has loved us and given himself for us in Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's pray. Father, when we consider your law, when we consider your gospel, we stand amazed as it reveals to us something of the glory of your being, something of the wonder of your character. We bless you tonight that you are indeed a God of great generosity. We bless you that you do not deal with us as our sins deserve, but as far as the east is from the west, so far do you remove our sins from us. We thank you for the instruction that we receive, even through that which was given first to Israel, but also to us in the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray tonight, our God, that your word would sink down deep into our hearts, that we would understand your law, and understand your gospel, and rest for our acceptance with you in the Lord Jesus Christ, that we might then be a generous people by your grace. O oh, Almighty God, hear our prayer, and may we confound the world by the power of your grace, that we, O oh God, would be what the world so often is not, generous upon generous, upon generous. May we be generous to one another. May we be generous even to our enemies that Christ might be glorified. For we ask in his name. Amen.